So lymphomas in general are uh, cancers of uh, the immune system. There are at least three major types of lymphatic cells, T cells, B cells, and NK cells. If one of those cells becomes malignant, then you develop a type of lymphoma that can be B cell lymphoma or T cell lymphoma or NK cell lymphoma. So peripheral T cell lymphoma is a type of lymphoma that derives from the transformation of uh, T cells. Peripheral T cell lymphomas are a minority of uh, the cases of lymphomas overall. Um, and one of the challenges is that they're also extremely diverse and heterogeneous. They're very difficult to diagnose and also they are quite difficult still to classify. In other words, uh, determining which particular type of peripheral T cell lymphoma any given patient has um, can be challenging and requires a lot of expertise on the part of the pathologist as well as the clinician. Most of the patients with uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma have symptoms that we call B symptoms. They may have fevers, uh, they have weight loss, uh, they, they have uh, night sweats sometimes. Often uh, there's also a profound sense of uh, fatigue. Another symptom that uh, patients may report is rash. In many cases of peripheral tissue lymphoma, the patient has a swelling of the uh, lymph nodes, the, the lymphatic glands. That could be in the neck, uh, the armpits, or could be the groin. Sometimes people have abdominal pain. Uh, from large you know, swelling of uh, the lymph nodes in the abdomen. Um, sometimes they may have uh, respiratory issues due to involvement of the lungs. One of the things about uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma that perhaps is much more prominent uh, compared to B cell lymphoma is the fact that peripheral T cell lymphomas tend to affect uh, organs outside of the lymphatic uh, the lymph nodes and the lymphatic system, we call them extranodal, and therefore they can affect the gastrointestinal system. For example, you may have some bleeding uh, from your bowels or abdominal pain. Uh, they may have respiratory issues, uh, so with shortness of breath, oxygen requirement, cough, and all of that. In general, these treatments consist of multi-agent, multi-drug chemotherapy uh, with chemotherapy regimens uh, that are used also for B cell lymphoma. So for example, there's a chemotherapy called CHOP uh, that is often used. Uh, there's a chemotherapy called uh, dose-adjusted EPOC that is also frequently used. And then another chemotherapy called CHOEP. Um, there are now actually uh, advanced clinical trials that are exploring uh, changes in these initial uh, chemotherapy regimens, usually by adding another drug to the backbone of uh, one of those chemotherapy uh, regimens. So because uh, the, the vast majority of the patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma uh, will relapse after their initial frontline treatment, the vast majority of the patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma will need additional therapy. And usually that occurs within the first eight, two years or within the first 12 months. There are a number of drugs that have been studied and approved over the past five to 10 years uh, for patients with relapsed refractory peripheral T-cell lymphoma. Um, some of them are, uh, again, available for use, um, uh, in, even from community physicians, um, such as, for example, a drug called romidepsin. Um, a drug called Belinostat. These two are part of a class of new drugs called histone deacetylase inhibitors. Um, there's another drug called uh, uh, pralatrexate that also is approved. Um, and then uh, a drug called brentuximab vedotin, um, which is an uh, uh, immunoconjugate, so it, it combines an antibody against a molecule called CD30 to um, a, a toxin that is linked to the antibody and then is released after the antibody binds to the tumor cells. Overall, the response rates to these uh, uh, drugs are relatively low. So they are in the ballpark of about 30% with very few complete responses. And peripheral T cell lymphomas are a group of diseases where, especially at relapse, uh, complete responses are the only way to really gain uh, meaningful survival advantage. If you don't have a complete response uh, in relapsed refractive disease, then the survival is very short, unfortunately. Um, the only drug that has a better uh, response rate in a, in a specific subset of uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas is brentuximab vidotin, uh, which targets CD30.
And with that drug in relapsed refractory patients, the response rates are quite high, you know, in the ballpark of about 70%. There are a number of uh, drugs in development uh, that are not approved uh, and are in clinical trials. It's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic uh, and interesting landscape of uh, clinical research right now in, uh, in T-cell lymphoma in general. Uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma in, in particular. Um, for example, there are uh, drugs that are targeting a type of uh, molecule in the cell that is called PI3 kinase. Uh, so they are PI3 kinase inhibitors. There are diff multiple different forms of these PI3 kinase uh, in the cells, uh, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Um, and uh, there's different uh, Types of uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors inhibit different families or different subsets, sometimes more than one. These drugs have efficacy in, uh, in uh, T-cell lymphomas, both peripheral T-cell lymphomas and uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. One um, is called Duvelisib uh, and uh, is also called IPI-145. In a study, in a relatively small study, but uh, with a good patient numbers, it had a response rate that was uh, uh, between 40 and 50%. So um, these are effective drugs. Now they're being used in combination. There are clinical trials that combine uh, duvelisib with uh, romidepsin or uh, with uh, uh, bortezomib, also you know, called Velcade. Um, the data for those clinical trials are promising. I don't think they're mature enough at this point to know whether they're going to make an impact. There are clinical trials looking at you know, newly diagnosed patients with peripheral T-cell lymphoma that combine CHOP and romidepsin or CHOP and Belenostat. These trials have not been reported yet um, because it takes time for the data to mature and for the outcomes to be followed. But I hope that uh, perhaps next year we're going to hear about them. These diseases are rare as a group and individually um, they are even more rare. So just to give you an idea, we mentioned that uh, peripheral T-cell lymphomas overall are about 10 to 12 percent of all lymphomas. Keep in mind that within that 10 to 12 percent, there are at least 25 different types of, uh, of uh, T-cell lymphomas. The most common ones are uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma not otherwise specified, so-called NOS, angiomonoblastic T-cell lymphoma, anaplastic glossal lymphoma, ALK positive or ALK negative. Those are the main types, but then there is a, a whole list of very rare diseases that, for which there is relatively limited knowledge of course and therapy, uh, they can be very difficult to diagnose and they're even more difficult to treat. So it really becomes essential that uh, uh, if you have one of those lymphomas, you really go to a specialist, not just a specialist in lymphoma, but also a specialist uh, in T-cell lymphoma, someone, a lymphoma specialist who has significant experience in, in, T in the treatment of T-cell lymphoma. So after, the, um, uh, after having you know, good family support and after uh, having a good relation with uh, your oncologist and uh, someone that you can trust and rely on, uh, I think that the most important thing uh, is uh, having access to uh, reliable resources um, and uh, support, uh, particularly uh, when you're dealing with a rare disease like uh, peripheral T-cell lymphoma. So there are several organizations that are really providing uh, uh, support with patients with lymphoma, uh, but uh, the Lymphoma Research Foundation is really the primary uh, lymphoma focus uh, organization that uh, supports patients uh, with lymphoma, including peripheral T-cell lymphoma. Having access to, um, to resources, uh, having access to information, being able to connect with other patients. If you live, for example, in a part of the U.S. where access to an expert can be challenging or you don't even know which experts are available uh, to you, uh, then I think having the, that information from the LRF uh, could make the difference between seeing the right doctor right away as opposed to having to wait months before actually getting in the right place. There are also a lot of issues about uh, uh, logistical you know, support, access, transportation, medications, information about side effects from drugs. So I think that uh, those resources are really all available to you through multiple uh, uh, outlets, but I think that the LRF is really kind of uh, one of the best for that.